Hello, welcome to Great Ayton Church and the James J. Binns organ. I'm David Baker and I'm going to take you on a tour of the organ. The first thing to say is that I'm sitting at the console, which is rather like the flight deck of an aeroplane. I've just switched the organ blower on, which sends wind into the instrument so that I can play it. The organ blower is a fan that feeds air into the organ bellows. Think of the kind of bellows that you might use as a fan to fan a fire. Before the advent of electricity, organs had to be hand blown. And here at Great Ayton, you can still see and use the hand pump to get wind into the organ bellows. So, I have switched the organ on, but nothing happens. I need to put the organ into gear, rather like you do with a car. I do it by pulling out a stop. This allows wind from the bellows to get into the pipes. Why are organ stops called stops? Because originally you actually stopped wind from going into the pipes rather than allowed wind to go into the pipes. Here I am playing on the open diapason. This is the basic sound of the organ and it is one of a number of stops in the principal family, so called because they are principal stops of the organ. If you look on the organ stop here, you will see that it says open diapason 8. Now if I push the open diapason in and pull out the forefoot octave, you'll hear that the sound is an octave higher. The stop does what it says on the label. The open diapason is at 8 foot pitch. The octave is at 4 foot pitch. And then we have a 2 foot pitch. But it would soon get rather boring to be playing on those stops all the time. So there are other types of stop that you can use. Also on the organ at Great Ayton is a stop called the stopped diapason. The word stopped means that the pipes have little stoppers in them at the top. So that they are of eight foot pitch in terms of sound, but because the pipes are stopped at the end, they only need to be half the length. So we have the open diapason and the stopped diapason. The third eight-foot stop we have on this organ is called the Dulciana. It's a second open diapason, but very softly voiced. Finally, on this keyboard, we have the Bordon. The bourdon comes from the French bourdonné to buzz. When you add the bourdon to all the other stops, it gives a fine, majestic, imposing sound. As well as playing notes with my hands, I can also use my feet because we have something down here called the pedals. Now when playing the pedals, of course, the organist has to learn how to do it to play the correct notes without looking down all the time because you're looking straight ahead at the music. An organist has only two feet as opposed to ten fingers so that while many notes can be played on the manuals at the same time, only two 
or at most three notes can be depressed by either the toe or the heel of the foot at any one point. So the player has to be able to coordinate hands and feet in order to play all the music. And I have two stops. I have a sub bass of 16 foot and I have a flute of 8 foot pitch. The manual that I have been playing on so far is called the Great Manual. Manual, the word manual, comes from the Latin manus, meaning hand as opposed to feet. The second manual, like the Great Manual, we have a number of stops. First of all, we've got the Geigen Principle. As the name implies, it's a diapason or principal stop. The word Geigen comes from the German for violin, Geiger, and the idea of the sound is that it's a harder, stringier sort of sound than the open diapason, its equivalent on the great manual. The next stop is an interesting stop. It's another eight-foot pitch stop, like the Geigen principle, and that's called the Lieblich Gedacht. The word Gedacht literally means stopped, so it's like the stopped diapason on the grate. But Lieblich means lovely, and it's meant to be a softer, sweeter, gentler sound. The third eight-foot stop we have on the organ is called the Vox Angelica. Vox Angelica literally means angelic voice and the idea is to depict heavenly sounds. The next stop is a four-foot pitch flute. The final stop on the swell manual is the oboe. With so many organ stops, it's intended to imitate the orchestral equivalent. Now, why is the top manual called the swell manual? Well, it's so called because the pipes are inside a box. And at the front of that box, there are a set of doors or shutters which the organist can open or close. When closed, the sound is distant. When I press the pedal down, the sound becomes louder or swells and then I can make it softer again. You'll also see that I can couple the manuals together. So if I have, for example, the stop diapason on the grate, and the oboe on the swell, and I have a stop here called swell to great, I can make the two stops sound together or not. I can couple the lower manual to the pedals. You'll see the keys actually move.
and I can couple the upper manual to the pedals. I can also couple the swell manual to the great manual an octave higher. This will be like my playing like this. But instead of having to do it, I've got a stop called swell octave to great. And I can also couple the swell to itself at the octave. Be like doing this. Now let's listen to David Wood, the organ builder who's recently restored the Great Ayton organ, talking about the technical side of the instrument. As part of the restoration work for the organ, we have to go through each of the different ranks of pipes on this organ. There are 13 different ranks of different sizes, different scales and different timbres of tone uh, for all ranks. This is a pipe from the Great, it's actually part of the Great Open Diapason and it's slightly slow, that pipe. In the air has to come up through the tip of the pipe, up through the foot, where it encounters a wind constriction plate called a languid, and it's forced through onto the top lip of the pipe to make the pipe actually make a sound. And unless the languid and the lips are in exactly in alignment, the pipe won't make the sound that we need it to make. It's prompt, it's quick, it's full, that's what we need it to sound like. So that's diapason tone for the organ. The other sort of tone that we have on the organ, apart from the flutes and the strings, is the reed tone, which works in a completely different way. This is a pipe from the swell oboe. And instead of just the air passing through and being directed onto different parts of the organ to make it speak, and to different parts of the pipe to make it speak, reeds work in a different way. Each reed pipe contains a small hollow brass tube called a shallot. This fits into the block of the pipe where it's ready to receive, receive a small sliver of brass called a tongue, which has a curve put on it by the voicer, so that when it sits on the face of the shallot, and is held in place by the wedge, the tongue will stand slightly proud of the shallot, so that when the air comes around the tongue, it'll try and flatten it to the face of the shallot, but the curve will make it spring off again and the wind will make it f flatten out again. And it does this repeatedly, very, very quickly, to produce the tone that we need for this particular rank of pipes. And that's the sound we need from the oboe. It's very prompt, very bright, it's a good stop. This is a pipe from the Lieblich Gedacht rank on the swell. Like the metal pipe we saw, it redirects the air to make the sound that we need to make the organ pipe speak. Air is introduced at the foot of the pipe when the organist presses a key and it travels up the foot to the block. When the air reaches the block, it's directed through a very narrow slot called the windway and from the windway it strikes the top lip and causes an oscillation within the pipe which is actually the note that we hear. This is a stopped wooden pipe so the vibrating column of air we are hearing actually travels up the top where it encounters a stopper so it has to come back down again and come out of the mouth. So actually, we're hearing a vibrating column of air which is that long rather than that long. The stopper is nicely fitted to the top of the pipe with a cushion of leather which gives us the opportunity to just move that stopper in and out so I can adjust the tuning and put it on the organ. Keyboards are a very important part of the organ. 
they are the main interface between the instrument and the player, so it's important that uh, the player feels comfortable at the keyboards. These keyboards are, um, this is the first time they've been restored, they are ivory and, and ebony and the traditional manner, um, and we've been able to find some second-hand ivory keys um, from a bins organ which was redundant, um, and very often the keyboards are worn in the middle two octaves, um, but on, at, at the extremes of the keyboards they're, they're quite good, so we were able to reuse um, ivory and have them uh, recovered, so they almost look like new. The felts have all been uh, renewed, and, uh, and the, these, these keyboards are almost as good as new, so, so that will be uh, good to go forward with. This is a restored pedal chest from the Great Ayton organ. This is the 16-foot pedal board-on chest on which the pedal pipes stand. You can quite clearly see that all the pneumatic motors within the chest have all been recovered in leather. All the valves made new and all the linkages are new. The pallets which are pulled down by the pneumatic motor are all new and it's all ready to go. This one's actually under wind at the moment. We can see quite clearly how it works. The primary action is this small pneumatic motor at the bottom of the chest, which is activated by a puff of wind, which comes from the touch box. That inflates this pneumatic motor and makes it rise. That in turn will lift this valve, which will empty the air out of the main power motor and pull the pallet down. Quite simply, like this. 